Welcome to Bletchley Park, a grand estate in Buckinghamshire, England. Despite its serene appearance, this manor and its surrounding buildings were a vital part of Allied victory in World War II, when they became the epicentre of Britain's wartime code-breaking efforts. This country is at war with Germany. By the end of 1940, France had fallen to Hitler's invasion forces. Britain was being pummeled by nightly bombing raids, while merchant ships were hunted in the Atlantic by German U-boats. Allied forces were desperate for any strategic advantage, and that included decoding Germany's encrypted radio communications. You're standing in the office of a man who was instrumental in setting up Bletchley as Britain's code-breaking HQ, and overseeing operations in the crucial first years of the war. Commander Alastair Denniston, the first head of the UK's Government Code and Cipher School. Bletchley offered easy access to London, as well as university towns Oxford and Cambridge, from which Denniston recruited top minds, including Gordon Welchman and Alan Turing. Denniston was unwavering in his commitment to gathering Nazi intelligence, but having worked in code-breaking for many years, including throughout World War I, he had no illusions about the scale of the problem facing the Bletchley team. That problem was Enigma, a mechanical device used by the German military to encrypt communications. Typing on an Enigma machine illuminated alternative coded letters, determined by a series of rotors, each of which had a possible 26 settings. Adding even more security was the plug board, which swapped letters with another letter of the operator's choice. To decode a message, all you needed was to replicate those settings on your Enigma machine, and the scrambled letters would become readable text. However, with over 150 million, million, million possible configurations, deciphering Enigma was virtually impossible. Even if you guessed the settings the Germans were using, regular configuration changes meant your luck would run out, often within a day. And yet, at Bletchley, cryptographers were able to read Enigma communications throughout most of the war. Here's how. Away from the luxury of the mansion, the heavy lifting of breaking Enigma happened in prefabricated huts like this one, built on park grounds. Deciphering Enigma began with the Polish, who'd cracked the machine before the war, and shared their knowledge with France and Britain in July 1939, on the eve of conflict. When Germany started switching its cipher systems on a daily basis, however, Bletchley's task became infinitely more complex. Luckily, the Germans made mistakes. Predictable messages like weather reports gave Bletchley cribs, best guesses that helped calculate the day's Enigma settings. Plus, Enigma had a fatal design flaw. A letter could never be encoded as itself. This fact, combined with cribs, gave codebreakers a vital foothold in crunching possible settings combinations. Thirdly, Bletchley relied on pinches, the capture of German codebooks, which were a treasure trove of code-cracking information. Germany would alter its Enigma devices, though, and keeping on top of decrypts was a constant, years-long struggle. Right at the heart of that struggle was history's most famous codebreaker. You're in the Hut 8 office of Alan Turing, the London-born mathematician who was instrumental in cracking the notoriously complex German naval enigma, and developed the Banbarismus technique, which leveraged probabilities to calculate the likely settings of enigma machines. Turing's wartime activities saved lives, diverting Allied ships away from the jaws of U-boat wolf packs, but his later contributions also resonate today. Turing's credited as the father of computer science and the field of artificial intelligence, and without his pioneering work, modern technology could look very different. Although he was gay, in 1941, Turing was briefly engaged to fellow codebreaker Joan Clark. Seven years after the war, Turing was prosecuted for homosexual acts, which at the time was still a criminal offence in the UK. Choosing chemical castration as an alternative to prison, Turing died just two years later. His death ruled suicide by cyanide poisoning. The end of Turing's life is a story of bitter injustice, but his legacy endures in the progress he made during his time at Bletchley. Perhaps his most famous contribution is the bomb machine for decoding Enigma, the design of which was unveiled in 1939, with colleague Gordon Welchman adding the vital diagonal board refinement a year later. Turing knew Enigma could be cracked through brute force testing of potential settings combinations, but the process was far too lengthy for a human to handle. 
The bomb, named in tribute to the Polish bomber decryption machine, was an electromagnetic marble, sending current through circular drums corresponding to sets of Enigma rotors, crunching the many thousands of permutations to calculate Enigma settings based on Codebreaker's cribs. The replica bomb that currently resides in Bletchley Park took 13 years to complete, but its wartime equivalents branched out much more quickly. Turing later visited the US to advise on bomb production, while another code-breaking machine developed at Bletchley, Colossus, is considered the world's first programmable electronic digital computer. Owing to the secrecy surrounding wartime code-breaking, the full extent of Bletchley's role in World War II and the pioneering work of its many cryptographers would only be revealed decades later. But visitors to Bletchley Park today are finally able to hear the full story. We hope you've enjoyed this brief look inside one of history's most fascinating sites.